you know, begin by introducing, uh, you know, Dr. Hong Yi Wang, uh, who's uh, not only a, a good friend of mine and, and a close collaborator on, on, you know, a bunch of projects that we work together, uh, but he's also, you know, more importantly, a postdoc, currently a postdoctoral fellow at the machine learning department of Carnegie Mellon University. And he originally got his PhD from uh, the computer science department at the University of Wisconsin uh, Medicine. Uh, so he's received, you know, multiple best paper awards, you know, the Baidu best paper award, uh, the Spice ad and top review awards at ICM and Europe's various national scholarships uh, that that I, uh, too many for me to list out here, as well as, you know, serving as program committee members for a lot of the most important conferences in the machine learning world, uh, as well as, you know, a committee member on, you know, MLSIS, which is the, you know, the, the I think the, uh, kind of the, I call it the hot place where all the ML systems researchers uh, uh, want to gather together and, and publish, right? So Hogi is very much a member of what I call the ML systems community. It's a community that I'm part of, and we do things with a focus on uh, the systems that take algorithms, models, and loss functions and actually execute them at different scales, whether that's from you know very small devices to workstations and laptops all the way to very large clusters. We focus on all of the issues that make the computing a practical and realizable. So without further ado, uh, I wanna turn it over to uh, Dr. Hogi to uh, you know, start the presentation. And we're looking very forward to hearing you talk about gradient compression in, in distributed training systems. Great, great. Thanks a lot, Chiron, for the kind introduction, and thanks a lot for having me. Uh, just uh, before I, I begin, uh, one, one quick question. So what's the philosophy of this uh, the question answering? So uh, do I receive a question on the fly, or is there a, a like question answering session after the talk? Great. So I think everyone uh, in this uh, virtual meeting, uh, um, there, there aren't too many people. So maybe what, what we can do is if someone has a question, you know, feel free to uh, kind of hit the uh, one of the reaction buttons. I think you can raise your hand virtually or something. And then I, as the host, uh, will just kind of uh, prompt Hongi to answer the question. We can also have a dedicated, you know, let's leave a little bit of time for question answering at the end as well as, as is uh, the usual case. How about that, Hongi? Awesome. Yeah, that would be great. So, uh... Yeah, just for the audience, whenever you feel anything uh, you have a question about uh, or anything you feel doesn't make sense, just feel free to, you know, to leave a question or just uh, you at, uh, at me. <laughs> it's uh, totally fine. All right, cool. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me again. And, uh, and uh, so today it's my great pleasure to share our uh, recent work on the uh, grading compression. So basically, I call this on the utility of grading compression uh, in distributed training system. That's actually the title. Uh, of uh, this year's MLCS paper. So if you are coming to MLCS next month, uh, happening in uh, Santa Clara at, at, at California, I'm happy to talk to you uh, in person. So um, but this is actually a joint work with a series of uh, result, uh, research results uh, with the entire Wisconsin crew and our uh, industry collaborators from Sony AI, and most importantly, my uh, postdoc advisor, uh, Professor Eric Ching. So uh, what I will talk about today is mostly like what we learned actually from working on the gradient compression in the past few years. So basically what's the main motivation? So why we actually need that and uh, what is actually uh, gradient uh, compression? The order is a bit weird, but you will, you will see that actually makes sense in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the main flow. And uh, most importantly, so when will that actually be useful? Um, by useful, I mean, when will that actually can be deployed in the uh, product or real system that actually attain a meaningful speed up and that preserves uh, the accuracy of your machine learning algorithm. And how should we actually design the next generation or some uh, awesome useful uh, grading compression method? So uh, let, me, let me quickly introduce, uh, give you some motivation of grading compression. So why do we even need that? So our journey actually happens, uh, start from distributed machine learning. So one of the most popular uh, method uh, or algorithm in distributed machine learning is basically mini-batch SV. So how does that work? It's very uh, simple, actually. If we want to minimize this loss function, let's say uh, we have n data points in our data set, which is basically the, the x here, we want to mo uh, optimize the model or model parameter w here. Uh, so what they actually do is like for a certain iteration or for each iteration, you basically sample a mini-batch from your uh, data set. And then you basically compute the gradient 
uh, of the, the sum of the points of your mini batch, and basically average the gradient and use that to uh, like uh, basically update your model. So if you look into this part, basically uh, your, your, the gradient computation across the data samples within the data batch you sampled, it's not, there's no dependency, right? That's why you can uh, parallelize that, uh, the gradient computation within the, the mini batch. And that's why it's called data parallel uh, mini batch SGD. So uh, one, I will basically walk you through one quick example of a batch size of three. Actually, there's, imagine we only have three example. Uh, in the in the batch you sampled, and we want to distribute that across the cluster. Let's say if our cl cluster only have uh, three GPUs, right? And we want to just uh, evenly distribute the uh, like gradient computation across those three GPU. Why we need that? It's basically just a simple load balancing uh, philosophy. And uh, so what's called um, like people are really using uh, in practice like widely. It's basically uh, all reduced HDD. What it's doing here is that uh, each GPU just computes a gradient with respect to each uh, data sample. We could just simply represent that by G1, G2, and G3 here. And uh, what's remaining to be done uh, to finish this iteration is basically try to synchronize the gradient across the GPUs inside the uh, cluster, right? So what you can do is basically you need to initialize uh, a certain round of communication. Let's say uh, each GPU can we communicate the gradient to their uh, neighbor GPUs and then try to aggregate the receive the uh, uh, like a gradient value, right? Then you can do that again. Um, and finally, what we really want is that each GPU has received the gradient computed uh, across all the GPUs in the cluster. So that basically finished the one round of uh, uh, data parallel SGD. And then what you can do is basically, uh, you can just repeat the, the, the procedure, right? Until the convergence uh, for multiple uh, iterations. Um, as you may notice is that as we just uh, distribute the computing power evenly across the number of GPUs, right? So um, the ideal speed up you should uh, uh, like expect uh, computation wise is basically, you know, proportional to the number of computer nodes. In this example, basically a number of GPUs uh, in the cluster. But that computation uh, speed up does not come with uh, for free. Right? It comes with the price. The, the price is basically you have to initialize uh, some rounds of communication. So that's something uh, people call the communication overhead. Uh, so basically, I basically borrow a result from uh, one uh, SOSP paper in 2019 uh, from Stanford. So basically, what they measured here is that the x axis, if you look into that, is basically the number of GPUs in your cluster. So um, and the y-axis here is a communication overhead measured by the fraction of the communication time taken um, for the entire iteration. So basically, uh, you can see here is that as your uh, cluster grows reasonably large, let's say 16 or 32 GPUs, the communication start to dominate the entire uh, like iteration time. So that's something like people call the communication overhead. So basically, what's really uh, pushing you um, backward from attaining linear scalability it's actually the communication you have to incur uh, in, in data parallel distributed training. So that actually uh, motivates the, the, uh, the, basically the invention of the gradient compression. Um, then basically walk you through what is actually gradient compression. Uh, the idea is very simple actually. Um, so remember what's actually communicated across the cluster is basically the gradient uh, elements. So if we count the number uh, of the message, basically count the message size, right? What's the message size is basically the number of uh, gradient elements. Uh, say you can imagine your gradient is a vector times uh, the precision you need for each element. Let's say just a single precision, which is 32 bits. And people, that's a, kind of like a very natural idea to think about that is uh, what if you can reduce the precision uh, it's actually called a gradient quantization. That's one of the instance uh, of the gradient compression that uh, instead of use the 32 bits for each element, right? You can reduce the precision to eight for a uh, two bits, depends on like what you want and uh, what's the accuracy you want to trade in. Or you can basically just sample the element, right? You can look into the element, you think about that. Okay, so you may think about the sum of element might be more important than the others and you can just sample them. Or just assemble totally uh, random, randomly um, of the gradient elements instead of sending everything. That's called a gradient sparsification. 
Um, so idea is very simple. Uh, let me walk you through some uh, quickly through some uh, classical uh, algorithmic instance of the gradient compression. So very first one uh, is called top case, basically a sparsification method. So what it does is basically you assume that uh, the gradient elements with a larger um, absolute value, uh, absolute magnitude of the gradient elements value is more important. So uh, what they're doing there is basically you are just uh, uh, ranking the gradient elements by the absolute uh, uh, magnitude. So here, if you're to do top two, you will basically sample the, the, the second and, and the fourth gradient elements. Uh, where ascending is basically the negative uh, three and negative four here, also uh, zero indices, right? You need to like put them in, uh, in, the, in the right place after the communication. So this is uh, basically uh, top K. And they also have, uh, this looks a little bit crazy. Uh, but uh, it's it's kind of like extreme uh, uh, like instance of uh, quantization. So basically, sign SGD. So what they, they did there is basically you ignore all the uh, like uh, gradient norm or kind of like a magnitude value. Uh, the only thing you communicate is basically a sign information of the gradient. So uh, turns out it works to some extent uh, in practice. Uh, but that's you can imagine that as an extreme case uh, of quantization. So uh, I myself also contribute a, a bit into uh, this um, uh, like, like field uh, by contributing an algorithmic instance here is uh, called Atomo. Um, so that what's Atomo is, why Atomo is fundamentally different from sparsification and, and quantization is basically uh, like this kind of like a defined de design specifically for a neural network. So if you imagine uh, the gradient of neural network, it's uh, uh, like matrices or like higher dimensional uh, tensor uh, instead of uh, a vector. So uh, if you're if you're a gradient is a kind of like matrix, you can sort of like use some uh, factorization method to try to preserve the um, important value in, in your in your matrix. So you can use some lower rank approximation. You use some what, uh, other approximation. So in our case, we use SVD. It seems to be a com uh, computationally heavy, and our result extended by a, a group of EPFL researchers to use a better uh, factorization method. So it's called Power SGD. So that's sort of like uh, like uh, considered as a state of the art uh, method currently uh, in the literature. So um, gradient compression has uh, achieved the. Uh, uh, a lot of success uh, in practice, uh, also on papers, is that um, it, in the sense that they compress the uh, gradient massively with introducing a few uh, very minimal accuracy loss. So sometimes you can also achieve even higher uh, like uh, accuracy compared to uh, vanilla SGD. But uh, the overall the information is that you can compress, uh, remove the redundancy uh, safely uh, without hurting your, your model. And uh, there's a kind of like a fruit, fruitful series of results uh, in, the, in the literature uh, published uh, a lot in the like New York's SML uh, conferences, but which is great that uh, as a researcher, because there's also a theoretical guarantee that uh, your method is guaranteed to converge when you enable the um, gradient compression. So uh, that's actually good as a, as a scientist, right? Like we, we show that uh, uh, things work uh, we show the possibility that things work with some benchmarking result and also theoretic guarantee. That's pretty good as a scientist. Uh, but here, um, also as, uh, as a practitioner, we also ask, want to ask ourselves, is this thing really useful uh, when we try to deploy this in, uh, into product? So back into our story uh, in Europe 18, like after we built Atomo. So basically we are very excited at that time. Uh, we, we seem to find some method that works very really well uh, in practice. And we want to talk to a lot of industry folks. We basically just try to reach out to people and, and say, hey, can you actually use our method in your product? So at that time, would we, uh, the information we received from the industry folk is not so, sort of like disappointing because uh, they're, they basically told us that uh, the method may not necessarily do meaningful speed up in, uh, in real systems. So it's kind of like disappointed at that time. Then we basically came back right to the lab and see uh, if we can run some serious benchmark result and delve really into the um, into the details to see what's really happening. So that actually uh, begins the, the uh, series of uh, research I want to share with you today. Uh, but before I proceed, do I have any any questions? I want to pause here for a few seconds. Great. 
Um, to everyone, the audience, this is a great time to, to ask some questions. You're good. I think we're all good. Um, I'll also have questions for you at the end, but let's uh, let's keep awesome. the ball here and yeah. uh, excited to hear what else you have to say. Awesome. Yeah. Um, great. Then, um, yeah, before I proceed, I, I just want to give some uh, disclaimers here that uh, we only focus on high performance computing scenario, where basically means uh, the training happens in the distributed clusters. Uh, you can imagine that's in the data center or whatever uh, the lab managed by uh, some experts. But also, uh, we mostly focus on data parallel distributed SGD. Uh, we, we will talk about something beyond data parallel, but mostly uh, this talk will be focused on data parallel uh, SGD. And also, we talk about something that uh, our implementation is based on all the system um, optimization you can do in practice. So basically, the story is based on the state of the art API uh that you can find in the in the uh, mainstream distributed training uh say pytorch distributed data parallel so yeah this uh, this is kind of like a main topic i want to talk about today like when does screening compression actually achieve promising speed ups so let me quickly give you some experiment actually um so setup here is very uh popular so basically standard uh, ResNet 50 on ImageNet, right? It's kind of like a standard baseline used by uh, basically all the tech giants. And uh, we're just uh, renting the machine from the uh, public cloud, basically AWS EC2, and we're doing the four uh, V100 instances. And we're doing weak, weak scaling, so basically per node uh, batch size is, uh, is fixed. And we're just uh, uh, putting things into PyTorch DDP implementation. So, Here's a, just uh, some result, right? Like we tested the power CD uh, as, as I talk about this kind of like factorization method. Uh, we we tried to uh, like uh, benchmark the, the uh, like MS top K. So MS top K is the same actually with the top K uh, implemented in the, in the uh, optimized way and also sign SGD. So now you can imagine, so this is the number of GPUs versus the iteration time, right? So basically lower is better. So here you can see the dark blue bar. It's always almost uh, like winning the, the game uh, for for uh, various size of uh, cluster uh, number of GPUs. So the dark blue bar is basically just the vanilla PyTorch DDP. So basically meaning that don't do anything is the best. So um, basically whenever you try to incorporate the uh, like a gradient compression, it actually actually causes you to slow down. So that's very surprising, actually. We <laughs> kind of like feel astonished in, in like when we actually see see, uh, see this result. Then we start to ask ourselves why why that happens, right? Like you, you start to as a system researcher, you always delve into uh, the details and see the uh, like breakdown result and see like uh, where things start to uh, go um, go something like you come track. So uh, we're asking ourselves the question: Why don't we see significant speed ups here? So I will give you a walk you through several reasons. The first reason is that um, the, in, in practice, uh, computation and communication are already overlapped with each other. So uh, let's think about this uh, quite a uh, very simple example of neural network. We have input and output, and we'll see what's actually happening in the backward propagation uh, like stage. So basically in the vanilla way, what we are doing is basically we compute the gradient uh, of each of the layers, let's say the last layer, the second last layer, and the, the very first layer. So after that, we get the, all the gradient, right? Like we we'll start to uh, share the gradient. Uh, remember in the previous example, which is doing the all reduce uh, operation, we basically start the communication, right? And uh, the communication overhead will be something, looks like something uh, like this. But that's only the vanilla way. Uh, like in practice, what, what people are doing is that, uh, you, you can, as you can imagine, the communication does not necessarily need to happen after all the computation uh, finished, right? Like uh, after you, you get the gradient of the last layer, you can immediately start the communication, right? It's just nothing to uh, like uh, constrain you to wait for with yourself uh, and, and until all the computation or, uh, computation are done. And then you can, uh, if you, you can like work on that result, you, you can see the communication overhead is uh, much, um, much kind of like a, a, like a smaller compared to the uh, 
like a communication overhead of the previous example. So if you align those two um, like a timeline, then you will see, you know, in practice, uh, communication overhead can be um, can be can be like much shorter compared to the communication overhead in the vanilla uh, like implementation. So uh, we actually did some like real benchmark result, right? Like we basically come up with an implementation that uh, you, you, you do the back probe um, and then you do the or reduce. So that's actually the result uh, in, the, in the top uh, of the top bars. And you actually see the overlap the uh, value uh, provided by PyTorch DDP. So that's actually the optimized version that uh, they try their best to overlap computation with communication. And you, what you see here is that actually in practice, uh, if you're using the the state of the art API provided by um, uh, like incorporating all the system optimization, the computation are actually uh, overlapped very well with communication. Just one reason why uh, a grading uh, compression does not uh, necessarily give promising speed ups, right? Like because the space is not that much uh, for you to to attain a real speed ups. So that's the first reason. Um, and, and, and another kind of like a, a small point here is that um, your computation actually scales with your batch size, uh, but your communication uh, that does not. So your communication, if you uh, imagine the gradient size, you, you really just average the, uh, the gradient with respect to the data points. And uh, that's actually the gradient size is only a proportional to your model size, uh, but the computation actually scales with, uh, um, with, uh, with uh, uh, like a number of batch size. So you can see there that uh, if you're using larger and the larger batch size, that what actually people uh, usually do in practice, that uh, it gives uh, like better, uh, like kind of like a larger space to overlap the computation with the communication. So we actually did the uh, same benchmark here. We basically just vary the batch size, right? That's the same result. Uh, the network is uh, ResNet like 101, but it's kind of like the same result. We just vary the uh, number of batch size here. So what you can see is that is, uh, if you're using small batch size, that basically means you have less uh, space to overlap computation with communication. So sometimes you can see in, in the batch size at 16 k per GPU, uh, sometimes uh, the compression method can give you some benefit. Uh, but when you actually increase the batch size, the, the kind of like it's diminishing the uh, speed up attained by the grading compression, sometimes even becomes slower. Um, so that's a main, um, reason uh, for their for the kind of like a commit computation and communication overlap. So the second reason I want to give you here is that um, those kind of like a compression method does not come for free. So sometimes when you compute the encoding and decoding, that's basically just a transform, right? You're sparsifying your gradient or kind of like doing the factorization or doing the quantization. Uh, that compute that, that actually extra computation is not comes for free. So sometimes if you look at the MS12K or in PowerCD, if you want to use a higher rank, that's actually not that fast. So imagine that the ResNet 50, uh, the backward cost is only like 100, a little bit more than 100 like millisecond, but uh, sometimes the encoding and decoding cost can be comparable to that. So imagine you are actually adding a lot of like extra computation uh, like to you treat in more computation to attain some um, like communication cost. So that's why um, sometimes the, the uh, like extra computation can dwarf the, um, the communication saving uh, by, the, by, the, by less, uh, communicating less bits across the cluster. So still, if I try to plot the timeline here, um, you're not actually just doing the uh, overlapping the computation with the communication. You're actually trying to overlap the computation with the encoding and decoding part uh, plus the communication. So, uh, you know, if you do not, uh, your method is not designed qu quite well, so the encoding time will be long and uh, there will be actually uh, be longer iteration time compared to the uh, vanilla HD. So basically the third reason is a bit, uh, it's mostly related to a high performance computing actually. So you, you can have a lot of topology uh, for implementing the uh, like distributed HD, right? It basically just synchronize your computed gradient. Uh, we just walk, walk you through one example, which is basically all reduced, but you can also do all gather or primary server based method, basically key value store. And uh, here actually, 
Um, so if we only allow you to choose one of the topology, not the we are not considering the hybrid uh, um, like strategy here. So you can see for most of the cases that uh, the people are using, so all it is is that it can be much high, uh, like a more efficient compared to the other topology. But the tricky part here is that if you consider the co-adaptation of algorithm and the system, right? Like uh, we allow to change the uh, system implementation of the system topology and also the algorithm. So something interesting will happen, right? Like some of the method is not uh, com compatible to all reduce um, like uh, SGD. So say the condensation is not actually compatible uh, with all reduce. So you have to use some like a slower implementation, say all gather or primary server. So that actually caused the problem. And uh, this is some simple reason why uh, all reduce can, uh, in some sense, like uh, faster uh, than, than the other method is that uh, if you are considering the, the cost model of the communication, it's actually captured by bandwidth cost and latency cost. Uh, I don't want to go to uh, too much details, but usually latency is uh, kind of like uh, smaller compared to bandwidth. Um, but here it's a P is a number of nodes and the alpha beta is basically just some constant and N here is uh, your message size. So if you only look into the uh, second column, right, which is the bandwidth cost, you can immediately see that uh, if you're using the ring or radius, so basically uh, uh, like uh, efficient implementation of radius, it has the term of P minus one divided by P, right? For the other, uh, like primary server and all gather, they don't, uh, they don't have necessarily have that one. So uh, the bandwidth cost is much lower. It's uh, almost does not scale with your number of uh, nodes in the cluster. So that's sort of like give you one reason why OREDUCE can be faster compared to the other topology uh, for, for a certain range of applications. So that's uh, the third reason. So basically some method is not compatible with uh, OREDUCE SGD. So basically in, in, in our example, uh, like we just walked through, uh, basically, top K and uh, and, and the sign SGD is not compatible with uh, um, like all reduce. So um, so one last reason is basically that uh, so for kind of like a decent uh, um, like a distributed node on the public cloud we can we can run right um, the the bandwidth is actually not that bad. So if you so here I just to show you one result that if you look at the dash line and the solid line. So that, that basically captures the ideal, uh, like uh, ideal runtime. Um, so ideal basically meaning that uh, the runtime, the pretty runtime, you can reach uh, linear scalability. So you can see that uh, for, for some of the tasks, the bird is something like uh, kind of like a weird actually. So, uh, so in bird, it's kind of like a different story. That model is really huge that you can actually uh, adopt the uh, compression master to achieve some really meaningful uh, results there. So, uh, but for the residual network here, let's say the 50 layer and the, like the 100 layer residual network, you can see the gap is not that, that large actually. So basically it means that there's not much space uh, for, the, for the compression method to work on. So basically for a certain range, uh, the method is, is, there's no, basically just no point to enable the gradient compression method. So the question now becomes, it seems like the, um, can or, or cannot reach to a meaningful speed up is depending on a lot of uh, factors, right? Uh, it's basically your hyperparameters, your model, and also your, your, the, the node you are using in the cluster. So, um, so we're basically imagine, like, can we do something methodological way to actually capture everything there, right? So that's a perfectly uh, a point that is a, a performance or cost model can fit in, right? Uh, like before I, I uh, introduce you the, the cost model, I want to give you a, another point here that uh, in practice, people are not just uh, comparing, it's just sending the entire gradient layer wise, right? Like in the previous example, I'm just uh, saying that you can send the gradient of the entire layer. In the practice, that's not what's going on. In practice, uh, you can imagine that some layers can be huge, right? Like if you're just uh, sending the gradient um, layer wise, for the synchronizing gradients of the huge layer can just uh, cause some network congestion. So what people are doing that is uh, using some bucketing strategy. Um, so say we want to cause the gradient, entire, gradient of the entire network into several buckets. Uh, in practice, as default value is basically 20, 20 or 25 megabytes. Um, but uh, you, can, you can split your gradient into a different number of uh, buckets 
and then start to do the communication. That's a, sort of like a, if you imagine that another uh, strategy of doing some uh, load balancing, but uh, let's let's imagine we're doing that in practice. And then you can start to write down what's actually going on, right? Like uh, by, by using a cost model. So basically what you have here is a computation and uh, also the uh, communicating cost of uh, the, the first K minus one buckets, right? Because you know, at most you can just, uh, the computation can uh, be overlapped, can, can be overlapped with the K minus one buckets. And uh, the last bucket is we, we have to uh, leave it alone as um, uh, you, you, you have always to uh, wait for, for the computation to be achieved to uh, start the communication of that bucket. So here, here we basically have the max term uh, that basically captures uh, how much you can uh, overlap your computation with your communication and plus the final uh, bucket's uh, communication cost. So, um, so this is a, so the TCOM and the T computation, you can capture that with uh, whatever uh, method you want to use, right? You can, you can learn a cost function, you can use the flops, or you can just use the alpha beta cost model uh, for communication I just introduced. So uh, why this is important? Because this can sort of like give you some sense that uh, uh, for, for giving tasks, well, we can just basically use this cost model to predict what can be the actual runtime, right? Here, uh, I just show you some of the results we did uh, in practice. We're not, some disclaimer is that we're not fine tuning this cost model very well. So you can see, uh, especially for birds, sometimes it can have some like a variance. Uh, but for most of the tasks we, we uh, benchmark, it seems to be, uh, it seems to be very, very uh, accurate to some extent, right? That predicts uh, uh, your runtime. Uh, very well. So a uh, very cool use case here is that, so if I give you a task, right? So let's say we want to train a ResNet on ImageNet uh, with some certain like batch size, right? So here I just show you the batch size uh, where it's from 16 to 64 that, uh, and, and I basically just give you a, a bandwidth of the cluster. So basically user provide me a uh, task hyperparameter and their uh, cluster they're using. Right, and I can basically immediately pro, uh, basically throw in the information into the cost model. And then I can ask myself that uh, what's the compression ratio I need to almost achieve, uh, achieve linear scalability, right? So we, we can never you know, achieve the linear scalability in some sense, but uh, this actually predicts, uh, give us a sense that uh, what's the compression ratio we actually need um, to, to achieve uh, like a good uh, like a sc uh, scalability or kind of like good speed up in practice. And uh, actually, as you see that uh, for bandwidth set uh, 10 uh, gigabits per second, it's, it's actually, you don't need that, uh, that much compression, right? Like you can just uh, compress that for four, uh, three, four times. And that's actually it. You, you don't have to pursue for like 100 or 200 times compression. That's what actually, if you look into the literature, most of the research paper actually focus on. They're just saying like, I want to, compress the gradient for like 1,000 times without accuracy loss. But in practice, that's not what you should achieve. Um, you should really focus on something that uh, you know, like has small uh, like encoding and decoding cost, and, and that, that's it actually. So uh, by that, hopefully I already convinced you that uh, some like insights uh, to design a kind of like a reasonable compression method in practice. So uh, let's, let's walk through, like give a quite, quite quick summary on uh, what we need. So first is basically we need to focus, actually focus on the encoding and decoding cost uh, instead of the high compression ratio, right? Like, you know, high compression ratio, maybe it's not sort of like necessary, but uh, you don't want to introduce too um, much extra computation. And also, uh, you know, the good compression method should be probably be compatible with or reduce. You don't want to design something that uh, is not uh, sort of like quite compatible and you have to use some like a kind of like slow APIs. And also there's something I haven't uh, uh, talked about uh, a lot, but uh, actually in practice, you should uh, also focus on the, the, you know, the preserving the information you're creating uh, information, right? That's something, uh, what we, we call that a good put. Uh, I think you, you may heard that a lot from Eric and, and Chiron, that um, you should focus on both throughput and the statistical efficiency in the same time, right? Like in the, putting that into the com uh, compression story that you should both achieve 
uh, like better encoding decoding cost and also compression ratio. Plus, uh, you, your method should preserve the uh, like gradient accuracy, uh, gradient information very well. Otherwise, you basically the accuracy drop will be uh, significant. That basically makes your method not uh, quite useful. So, so by, by saying that, do I have one example actually working in practice? So I actually, actually, actually did that. Uh, uh, it's like actually another paper uh, uh, we published uh, last year in the, in the MLCs that uh, partners with our uh, industry collaborators, uh, which is uh, Sony AI, that uh, we call that the power fish. So actually, the the, the story of power fish is very uh, simple. That uh, you do not touch the gradient explicitly. Uh, instead of just training the full uh, run kind of dense uh, like neural network, so here is a kind of like still the three layer neural network, and the, the network weights can be captured by three matrices. You can train instead the factorized version of that. Where like instead of training the W1, you can train the factorized version of U1, V1, and the same thing applies to W2 here. So it sounds like a no-brainer. It's a kind of like an old idea that people are using that in in, gradient, uh, in, in the model compression. But uh, uh, in practice, there are something more to, to care about. But uh, here, if you just do that, right, the encoding and decoding cost is basically zero. So you don't have to do anything because you're just, just training a small network. So your gradient is already compressed. You know, it's already become smaller. And uh, since you're just replacing one layer, essentially, one layer by two skinny layers, and they're just uh, training another network basically. So you're definitely compatible with or reduce. So what about good put actually? So that's uh, the, the kind of like important part in, in Puffer Fish that uh, if we just simply adopt this method, right, in the uh, ResNet 50 image net example, you start to see some uh, immediate accuracy loss. Right, so that's not quite acceptable. 3% top one accuracy loss, some sort of like significant. So what we can do about that is basically, so uh, motivating by this plot here, we're just starting the uh, redundancy concerning the network layers, right? It seems like the front layers um, seems to attain higher run compared to the uh, bottom layers. Then what we can do is basically we are just using uh, some hybrid network architecture, which is to leave some front layers alone and just uh, factorize the later layers since the later layer has uh, more redundancy. And especially uh, for the convolution network, you know, most of uh, the parameters is uh, uh, captured by the later layers. And another thing we can do is basically, you don't necessarily have to start from the beginning, right? Like you, you, can, you, can, you can just uh, warm up your forerun network for a few epochs and you factorize that. Then you start to do your factorization. Um, that's uh, those two uh, tricks we found uh, that sort of like work very well in practice that if you adopt that, we can mitigate the accuracy loss uh, basically significantly. So um, this is basically captures, you definitely have to treat in some throughput, right? Like, but they also attain very good uh, statistical efficiency in the sense that your final model still are comparable almost um, to your vanilla network. So what we actually, actually do here is that uh, if, we show, if we see the benchmark result, we basically have to incur no extra uh, encoding and decoding cost. And uh, since we are computing a, smaller network, it, it's a kind of like a 10 slightly faster computation. Uh, it's a, also a 10 faster communication, although not very compatible, uh, not, not kind of like a faster compared to the uh, state of the art com communication method, uh, but still kind of like a fast enough. Um, if you uh, measure the end-to-end -end, uh, like uh, convergence uh, speed, so basically you have something uh, like 1.7, sometimes 2x compared to the vanilla SGD. You can also beat the uh, previous, um, like uh, previously designed uh, method. So, so this is actually the most uh, important plot I want to show you that. Uh, so imagine here the vanilla SGD is a previous dark blue bar. So basically that beats everything uh, in, in practice. So this is a PyTorch DDP vanilla implementation. But uh, what we can achieve here by just using power fish is that uh, we can achieve something higher than that. So not the, still a gap from uh, ideal uh, scalability, but we are measuring the scaling efficiency, which is actually the, the capturing how far you are away from the ideal speed up. 
It seems that's already uh, pretty pretty good actually. Well, still not ideal uh, speed up, but uh, already pretty good. So what if we can treat it more uh, accuracy, right? Like uh, let's say you want to, we can tolerate, let's say one or two percent of accuracy loss, then we can do even better. We can do something like very close uh, in a certain range to the ideal uh, uh, scalability. So uh, that seems to be very promising. Uh, I don't have uh, much time, but uh, let me give you some, uh, but how, how do you achieve those uh, kind of like more aggressive compression, right? And also, uh, as you may actually notice that in the power fish, we actually have introduced a lot of like uh, extra parameters, which is uh, basically how you capture the rank of different layers and uh, how you select the warm up uh, epoch and, uh, and uh, you know, like how many, how many layers you don't want to factorize, right? That's uh, kind of like a extend, extended version of power fish uh, we basically just submit this uh, paper uh, this year. It's uh, called Colorfish. It's basically you just want to try to capture all the hyperparameters um, using some carefully designed heuristics. So, um, so here, as I just uh, uh, like motivate you, is basically you're kind of like in the very large search space, right? So different layer can basically have a different choice of uh, of the rank selection. And you can also have different uh, number of uh, the warm up epochs and number of layers you don't want to uh, factorize. So that actually gives you a large search space. So what you want to do in this uh, like figure is basically you want to go to the uh, like uh, top uh, left corner, right? Like you want to have very high uh, final accuracy and a very small model. So uh, what I want to try to convince you here is that you can just use the, the new uh, like extended version of Cuttlefish to do that. Uh, that will give you something uh, very, very uh, e effective. So here, um, our message is basically motivated by what will happen actually during the training procedure if you are, if you are giving a way to estimate your run for different layers. So here we're just estimating the run ratio, basically uh, the estimated run divided by the uh, full run of the, of the network layer. So what you can see here is that so different layer actually seems to uh, have different um, like rank ratio uh, when, the, when the model start to converge. And another observation here is that it seems the estimated run can vary very quickly in the beginning of the training procedure and then start to converge. So that basically gives us uh, the idea, right? Like we can actually try to leverage the uh, rank estimation method and also a switch from full rank to low rank when all the estimated ranks start to converge uh, during the training. So that actually gives us uh, the, the method. And also um, what's actually very uh, excites me recently is basically you, uh, if you, if you imagine that you can actually solve the rank selection problem using explicit optimization, right? That actually has been done in by a CVPR paper in 2020. They're just trying to capture uh, solving the loss and the rank explicitly. So that's just the first efficient uh, inference, not uh, achieving any speed up in, in, uh, in the training. But what we can see here is that, so our method of color fish is basically the dark uh, blue uh, dots here. And the LC compression is basically the, the triangular uh, like dot here. So you can see using our uh, heuristic, they actually match up with the explicitly optimized rank selection very well. So that basically means you can have a near optimal rank selection during training. That basically means you don't have to trade in any uh, like extra computation. And you can just use that uh, to guide you to select the near optimal rank selection. That can give you the speed up in the training uh, for both computation and communication. That seems to capture things very well. And uh, to give you some extra result here is that, so compared to PowerFish, we can almost compress the network for you know almost more than four times without any accuracy loss. Sometimes it's uh, even uh, get a fat, uh, like uh, kind of like higher accuracy with smaller um, kind of like a faster computation time. So this is basically just a single node result. I don't actually capture the, the add any uh, communication here yet, uh, but even by looking at that, you already get something uh, very promising. And uh, like uh, it also works for uh, the transformer, right? Like you, you can basically check our paper. It will be on our archive soon. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can find your favorite network there. We basically tried everything, uh, like uh, basically RSTM, convolution, uh, transformer, everything, basically BERB GPT-2. So 
uh, by that, I basically, that's actually what I uh, have to say for today. Uh, but uh, for some future work, like what will happen actually beyond data parallelism, right? Um, as the model is going very, very large. So basically just using data parallelism cannot train all the network. So people have to combine with the, uh, with the pipeline and the model parallelism, right? And, uh, and you can also add data parallelism to make them work together. That's so-called hybrid and the 3D parallelism. So, uh, but if you're looking to what's actually happening there is that, so what's actually communicated there is not a gradient anymore. Well, it's not solely gradient anymore. So you also have to compare, uh, compress some activation value that's, com that's computed by your network. So basically the intermediate value uh, between, between layers of your network. So that, that's actually immediately incurred the question that uh, does gradient compression necessarily be equal to the uh, compressing the immediate the intermediate value? So uh, we're actually working on that. It's actually, it's actually not. So your, uh, the method that works for gradient compression does not necessarily work for intermediate um, output. So sometimes your gradient can be low run, but your intermediate value is not. And, um, and the how you actually can compose the different uh, parallelism strategy that uh, to give you a kind of like optimal method for, um, especially for heterogeneous cluster, right? For cluster contains both CPU nodes and GPU nodes, and also GPU with different versions, right? Like what will happen? So how can you come up with a method that will automatically combine different uh, parallelism dimension and then come up with the optimal uh, final strategy? That's also a, a mess, this is a question that's quite, quite interesting. And also uh, we have the cost model sort of uh, for the uh, data parallel um, grading communication and the compression. So how does that work for uh, model and par pipeline parallelism? Right, that's also a, an open problem. Um, so with that, I, I, uh, that's almost everything I want to say. And uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, I'm ready to take uh, some uh, questions here. All right, thank you very much, uh, Hongyi, for the excellent presentation. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left in the, the session, so you know enough time to, to pick Hongyi's brain about different questions. Does anyone uh, want to take a, a, a shot? You know, we have many students in the, the audience as well. Don't be afraid to, to ask Hongyi uh, even you know, a very naive or, or silly question. I'm sure a lot of you know, us in the audience are new to this field of ML systems. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, great questions that you can ask Hongi that, that uh, you might not be able to find easily by searching online or reading papers. So I hope that we can use this as a session to improve our collective knowledge. Yeah, no question is stupid, by the way. And uh, just uh, happy to take any, any questions or any discussion. Hi, Hongi. Hey, great Sam, talk. how are you? Good, great talk, excellent. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, I would like, I would have just one clarification question for the cuttlefish. So, and, and also, uh, so how do you do this uh, low rank decomposition? Isn't that very expensive? As oh, a, you know In terms that. of computations, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, right, I agree. So you have to do that. Uh, uh, if you have to do that per iteration, that would be that would be super expensive. Actually, that's what we did for Atomo. If it, actually, when I think back, it's a bit it's a bit uh, kind of like a, a silly actually. So, but here you 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 can you can only do that per epoch. So, well, for the most of the network, it's between like like I don't know what like uh, three hundred epochs or something. Uh, that's much better compared to per iteration. And, uh, and and here actually you only need the singular values instead of the uh, everything actually if you want to compute the SVD. So there's a lot of faster uh, estimation that can give you actually is incorporated in PyTorch. You can say that uh, like uh, uh, only compute singular values is uh, is great. So that can be very very fast. So here uh, when I show you the actually it's end to end time. It's, it contains everything. It's not the also the computation uh, of the also the warm up, right? Like on the warm up stage, you are training the full run network. Uh, that's that's the same as vanilla VDG actually. Then it captures everything. So if you uh, 
consider that in, you will still be faster. Okay, <clears throat> great. So, and uh, one more question. So when you kind of switch from this pool rank to low rank, uh, but at that time you you have to do the full decomposition, right? Because then you have to initialize yeah. weight somehow. Okay. Right, yeah, that's true, that's true. But, but you have uh, only to do that once during the entire yeah. training procedure. Yeah, that's, uh, we have the result in the paper. It's actually, I guess, 0.1, 0 0.2% of the entire time. Yeah, okay. it's uh, basically okay. marginal. It's really negligible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for the, for the, for the question. Yeah, thank you for the talk. We have time for, I think, you know, maybe another two or three more questions. Is there anyone else from the audience that would like to ask Hongi? So I have a maybe admittedly very simple question, but one that I hope might be you know relevant to the to the many people in the audience that might not be ML systems experts, but are curious on you know how to get in and start using these things. So, is there a place that uh, we can go to 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 use your work to get it? Uh, you know, what does it make to take to make uh, many of these gradient compression methods like turnkey software that we can just plug into our say our PyTorch projects or instance, like do you have any that's, advice? Yeah, that's a very, very great question actually, Chiu. So that's something I want to, uh, so, so the simple, so simple answer here is there's, there's none. So I can share my, my code, but there's none uh, like uh, already published or released a software uh, that comes up with the standard uh, of the uh, grading compression implementation. So PyTorch has something called uh, uh, like a, a grading compression hook that you can, uh, it's compatible with the PyTorch DDP that you can use. But the method there, you have to still write your own. So that's something, um, actually I want to propose to Eric probably in the, in the next individual meeting is that, so what if we, like, what if we can build one, right? Like we, we come up with a standard implementation of all these things, right? Like a power SGD, like top K, random K, that's compatible with the uh, uh, PyTorch DDP or whatever platform that's, Optimized. We optimize that very well, right? Like we could guarantee that uh, our implementation is optimized. It's uh, it's can run. It can run on GPU, and it's compatible with the uh, deep learning frameworks. Mm. I so guess that can make a, 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 some like a good amount of uh, impact, actually. Yeah, and the significance of that would be uh, so. So the closest analogy I can think of here is that uh, you know PyTorch at one point subsumed the the mixed position. Uh, floating point project from NVIDIA, right? The AMP project, right? Used to be a separate project, eventually got subsumed into the, into PyTorch's uh, like core libraries, right? Yeah, so yeah. It seems like, uh, it seems like, you know, this is a great discussion, right? It seems like a similar effort would be needed where, okay, mixed position training is now a thing that's part of PyTorch, right? And then, you know, uh, compression is in a way not too far off in, in terms of the level at which you hook into for, exactly. for training, right? And I think that is a, uh, you know, very interesting question for the the, the, the gradient uh, compression uh, community to explore, right? Finding the right place to, to hook into. Uh, it's just like, you know, even in my own experience with the Pollux and Adaptable Good Paper, right? Uh, uh, there, there were many optimizer hooks that we had to program in order to actually measure the statistical efficiency out of the uh, PyTorch, uh, you know, optimizer, and then use that to to compute good put, right? So, so I think that that's always the interesting question when we take our systems uh, prototypes from a uh, a one-off prototype that's implemented on a single model to something that that can be hooked into and becomes a standard part of a software library in an ecosystem like PyTorch, right? I think that that's yeah. one of the exciting thing. Uh, uh, and 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 it, it's also how open source projects get built. So it's a topic I'm excited to hear about. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's something I'm uh, I'm actually very excited to build. But if there actually if there's any uh, people that are interested in the uh, in this uh, in building this in the busy AI community, uh, I'm happy more than happy to talk talk to you uh, like offline, and we can I guess start immediately to build something. But if you imagine that. Writing something like top k random k is, is actually almost trivial, right? You can start from there, like uh, also adding in some uh, some some our own method 
And then we can start from there, right? Like after adding some like quantization, uh, like subversification, we can already have some like uh, initial release, right? This, this should be something very doable and can make a, a long-term uh, impact actually. Mm. Great, great. Thanks for the very inspiring remarks for me. And, uh, you know, one last call for, for questions for our speaker. Well, let me throw one last closing question, which is kind of uh, maybe a question for for like advice for for you know young students that are entering like systems and our field, right? So you know, I noticed that you had a a very nice collaboration with Sony, right? And I I think it's always great that we as ML researchers, you know, let alone ML systems, right, just as ML and AI researchers. Uh, you know, strive to have an impact uh, uh, in, in, say, an industry or an application where our work is actually being actively used for a real application. Like, can you give us some of your life advice on how, uh, you know, you people can get into these types of industry collaborations and make uh, these, uh, you know, fruitful uh, uh, papers that show off both, you know, university strength as well as the collaborative strength with a uh, with the you know maybe a research team of a big company like Sony. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. Actually, I um, I guess to put the long story short, actually, <clears throat> I feel the most important thing is like you, you just keep your mind open. Actually, so when some industry folk come to you. Or maybe you come to some industry folk, right? Like maybe some like Google, Green, Meta, you want to work with them. You just want to, you know, keep your mind very open and listen to what they are, uh, what they care about, actually. So, you know, as a researcher, sometimes uh, what I observe in, in you know, uh, in, in my experience is basically we're focusing on getting some result very quick and very promising. Um, but, uh, but, but, but but based on my journey, what I learned from the previous experience is that you should also focus on the, the scale. Do we actually work on the puffer fish? That's the story I can give you that uh, we get some working results on CFR10, some very small network very quickly, and we got excited very easily and we want to publish a paper. And our Sony collaborator just said, no, that's actually, that's not serious enough. Let's put that onto our, uh, our workflow. Then we start to look into the ResNet 50 ImageNet example. Then things stop the work, right? That's the result I showed you here, that uh, you actually see a very huge accuracy gap. Um, and that's not uh, quite acceptable uh, in practice. So what I want to say here is that when you actually take the scale into the, into the consideration, things can be completely different. So you have to you know, keep your mind open and hear what's actually going on in practice and in the industry application and start to modify, push your method further to make until it makes things really, uh, really better for the industry scale products. Yeah, so basically, my uh, the major lesson that I've learned in the past few years. Great. Maybe one last uh, closing thing. Um, do you have a a contact email or address that that uh, in case you know people want to send you follow up questions or you know requests for code, requests to collaborate? Uh, just uh, because I just noticed you didn't put one in your slides, right? So any, any oh any yeah, so text? yeah, I guess we just uh, uh, let me just quickly type my maybe CMU uh, email address. Um, yeah, that's actually just my uh, CMU email address. I, uh, yeah, just feel free to reach out uh, to this email address. Oh, I think there's another. Uh, oh yeah, I guess that's the question uh, you, you just asked. Yeah, just feel free to reach out. I mean, it's uh, more than more than happy to talk to you uh, more offline. Okay. Well, just for you know, all those in the audience that were looking to 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 talk with Hongi uh, offline, you know, uh, feel free as he's kindly invited us to, to you know send emails to his address. Uh, and uh, you know, Hongi, thank you so much for for coming to speak at our colloquium today. Uh, we hope that we will have you know, you know further engagement with you on research in the ML systems area. So thank Definitely. you for all the people who attended as well. And you know, this marks the, the close of our uh, sec I think this is our second CIAI colloquium session. Mm -hmm.